This is Twit. Now, Connie, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but since you're here, we should probably ask you about Chat GPT, CNET. Ooh. Use Chat GPT to write. S no, you don't want to. You don't want to talk about this. No, no, I'm totally happy to talk about. It. We didn't use Chat GPT though. Oh, use something else. Yeah. Use seven, ahead, seventy-five articles. Now, this is the report, and that's why you're here. No, it's not why you're here. But now that you're here, I'm going to definitely ask you about it. Uh, was AI of some sort was used to write articles about? Uh, it was about. Um, Personal finance. Now, I have to say, I think CNET handled it properly, saying, in fact, uh, you know, they had a human review everything and all of that. Oh, here's your post. Look at that. Let's look at look at your post. And this is how it came out, I think. Yes. AI assist. Okay. That's, so so okay. tell me what's going on. Yeah. So we have been using one, one team at CNET, the personal money team has been testing the use of an AI to write what we call basic explainers, like what is a credit card? What is compound interest? Since the middle of November, and the stories had a byline, and if you clicked on it, it, it was seen at money staff. And if you clicked on it, it said it was created in part with an automated technology, it an says AI it engine. right here, yeah. Reviewed, fact-checked, and edited by our staff, so by humans. So we changed the, it was a hover before, ah. and then somebody, you know, found that we had been doing this. It wasn't, it wasn't a secret, but we didn't pre-announce that we were doing this. We didn't put out a press release. But that's a good way to test it, right? To see, you know. Well, that's, it depends on your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we did not pre-announce it. I mean, we told the staff internally that we were looking at an AI engine. And obviously the crew in this uh, on the money team knew what was going on. And everything was um, checked and reviewed by an, an editor because the experiment that we're doing, which is ongoing, it's not done, is, you know, there's all this hype around this technology. How can it help you? And our model was, can it help for some kinds of stories where we don't have staff to write and does it actually save time for these editors? How long does it take to edit pieces? So we're going to be looking at all of that. Like I think almost every media company is looking at different ways to get an assist from tech. And I will say as a long time tech journalist, I worked at Bloomberg many, you know, a decade ago, uh, there has been AI technology helping us with stories. It's just at various levels. Chat, chat GBT is on this other extreme, which people have been talking about, like writing Shakespeare for you instead of Shakespeare. And uh, that's not what I'm talking about here at all. But, uh, you know, there have been stories that are auto written on the stock market. Prices go up, prices go down. Consumer index goes up, consumer index goes down. Those those things have been going on for a very long time. This sports is actually sports stories, too, have been written by computers for years. I mean, this has been going on for years. But that's because they're very so, they're very mechanical, you know. Uh, you can look at a box so, yes. score and write that story. A computer can write that story. Same thing with financial stories for the most part. So I we don't know the answer yet to whether it's, it's worthwhile. But we're trying to find a use case. And in this case, the use case was these basic explainers that... You know, we have a staff of really smart, talented reporters. And if I said to them, could you write a basic explainer or could you write an in-depth feature and go and interview people? I know where they want to spend right. their time. But you have to have some of that other. Those basic explainers are, are valuable. It's just a matter of resources. So that's what the test was. And that's what I wrote uh, in that blog Is, post. And anyone can read for themselves. Was this uh, your idea? It was not my idea. <laughs> uh, I am like most journalists. I am slow to adopt new technology. Yeah. I always like to kick the tires and, and test things and understand the implications. But we are at about the beginning of a process with some of this AI tech, like I said, to auto insert numbers and stories, right? We, we report on mortgage rates as part of that money team. You know, those numbers are auto insert and just like stock prices. Are inserted, so it's part of a process of looking at that technology that I think warrants 
the same kind of scrutiny that CNET would give to any other technology. And I linked to some examples of stories there where we, you know, we looked at duplex when it first came out and we're like, is this Google du duplex a good idea or not? I, I went and looked at the Magic Leap headset, headset when it was announced. Is it BS or is it brilliant? Like, this is what we do. And I hope other people are doing as well, because you can be afraid of the future and what tech might bring, or you can be part of helping to find how to usher it in. So, I found a use yeah. case. What's that? Uh, I actually wrote about it for Amy Webb's uh, Future Today Institute. Uh, using Chat GPT three, I was able to create uh, a Honeybot. So a the code or no no uh, yeah. So we used the bot and populated it. It's with it's, content from Chat. Well, content specifically relating to network uh, topology. Oh, interesting. So if someone was trying to hack the network, rather than denying them like a traditional IPS would, just blocking them at the source so they can't get into the network, it would actually simulate an intrusion. So someone thinks they're in the network and it's an entirely a, a fiction created by ChatGPT3. <laughs> and it was- and it's plausible. <laughs> it's plausible. It, and, and this instance I was using wasn't specifically tuned for that, but it still gave- an incredible simulation of, yeah, this is what an intrusion would look like. So imagine that your network defense is just making up stuff on the fly so that someone attacking your oh, network. Oh, I think there's lots of uh, oh, yeah, uh, cool and appropriate uses yeah. for this. Do you want to talk about what how, how you did it, Connie, or is that a state secret? Oh, we're not talking about it beyond okay. what I wrote in that Except uh, that it was not that chat, it was not chat GPT. No, it okay. was not. Okay. But there's a that lot. I, I mean, there's a lot of tools like chat gpt is by no means no. unique paris as a reporter <laughs> what's your attitude towards this i mean do you, you, you worry that mean, this effect might affect your living not really i'm not particularly worried that it would affect my living because i think the sort of journalism i mean i think it's just what connie said most reporters probably don't want to spend their time uh doing the sort of necessary but maybe slightly more rote work and part of journalism and instead they'd rather spend their time working on larger features or bigger reporting projects and i think that these sort of tools can be a great like way to augment your workflow where instead of you know i had worked at uh publications where you'd have to not churn out a bunch of content but for lack of a better word churn out a bunch of content yeah. because that's part of the job right. and if you had a way to do that very quickly and then you could spend most of your hours working on the sort of stories that matter most to you i think that's good i have to wonder is there are there any reporters who aren't at least enlisting a little help from chat gpt on some of these boring rote bits i i completely understand that uh and as and I, and, and, and kind of you did the right thing you've got a human reviewing it the only issue with chat gpt is it's it's a sometimes it's confidently wrong, right? right? It's it's it says it with such assurance that you go, oh, it must be right, and it isn't, and so I, you check that obviously. Again, I don't, I I don't use Chat GBT, so I can't speak. Oh, to you got to try it. It's very the yeah, yeah. There is I, a clear well, I watched. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I was going to say I watched Ryan Reynolds use it in his ad for. Wasn't that wild and mid-mobile? Yeah, it but I think the key to anytime there's a new technology used, and in, certainly in this case where there are completely valid and re legitimate concerns about, you know, is it gonna take people's jobs away? Because I'm sure every tech takes people's jobs away, but is to label the content. And we didn't label it as clearly. You had to hover and click to find out. So that changed this week where we said, well, just let's just say it and let, let's not back away. But are other publications that are using the technology today being as forthright and labeling and being transparent about who created what content? That's something that has to happen as a discussion in the industry as a whole. So uh, I'm not saying that, you know, like I said, that it, the, the jury's still out and how and what the use cases might be. But I think um, making sure that we're labeling this stuff and we're also not afraid to test it and mm -hmm. try it as part of the path forward. You know, one of the reasons why this story has hit so hard is we did not expect the advancements in GPT to come as quickly as they did. If you look at text that has been written by GPT-2, you can tell that it was auto-generated. Oh, yeah. 
because tech, it will find a couple of facts, a couple of the nuggets that it wants to put in, and then it just keeps repeating them in different ways. So it's a pretty easy way to figure out that this is an auto-generated piece of content. Chat GPT-3 doesn't do that. It is an order of magnitude more sophisticated than GPT-2, and we did not expect that they'd be able to get to that level this quickly. And now the question is, well, when they release the next version that is using more than 175 billion different parameters to do its predictive texting, what are we going to get? I mean, it's, it's already at the point that I have had, had uh, inquiries from some of our universities on how can we detect auto-generated content from students. And I told them, well, right now, until we come up with something more sophisticated, what you need to do is you have to get a baseline sample of the writing from the students at the very beginning of the oh, course. Oh, that's smart. Because that's the only way you're going to be able to tell. Get you're not going to find the yeah. errors in GPT-3. Yeah. Jeff Jarvis uh, has talked about a, a teacher who's going to use chat GPT in her English classes. And I think that's probably the case is that uh, it's foolish to hide your head in the sand. Yep. And that's I it. agree with you. It feels like we are at an inflection point, that there's some sort of Cambrian explosion going on with AI, not just yep. ch not just text, but uh, with the illustration as well. And mm -hmm. uh, AI voices have gotten better and better and better. And um, I think very, very interesting. So I, yeah, I don't, I'm not one of the people who was critical of uh, seeing it at all. Cause I think you did, you did it the kind of, if you're going to do it, they'll do it the right way. And I think there is a good use, use case for it. And that people like Paris will always have work because no, somebody, I wish I could find the source. I think it was on our Twit Mastodon. on somebody said chat GPT is the, is, is just basically the ultimate mansplaining. It's, <laughs> it's just this confident yeah, kind of, yeah patronizing voice saying well well if, actually actually <laughs> just in case you didn't know and then it's confidently wrong Stephen Wolfram of Wolfram Alpha who is I think arguably one of the geniuses of our time wrote a very interesting piece about how chat GPT might use Wolfram Alpha to correct the stuff it gets wrong he talks about some of the the confidently wrong conclusions chat GPT comes up with like this how far is it from Tokyo to Chicago and chat GPT gets it wrong. It says, uh, well, uh, the distance is uh, 76,000 miles. It's a very long distance. It would take a significant amount of time to travel one place to the other. Uh, the flight to, uh, to Tokyo from Chicago is about 16 hours. Blah, blah. It sounds pretty convincing, but it's wrong. Because if you ask Wolfram Alpha, instead of 7,600 miles, it's 6,313 miles. And, uh, and he says, by the way, you can teach chat GPT. By adding that information, and then ChatGPT says, well, thank you for correcting me. You're correct. The distance from Chicago is uh, 613,613 6, miles. And then you can ask it again, and it will then get it right. Okay. Okay. So it learns. Which is very interesting. So his premise is there are things that, because of the way Wolfram Alpha works, Wolfram Alpha knows the 3 to the power of 73, which is not 14 billion, but in fact... A different number, much larger, uh, that it could be working with ChatGPT to fix it. But people should be very careful about ChatGPT, especially when it comes to factual matters. Leo, it is mansplaining. Uh, I okay. I just came up a pitch for a show, a new Twitch show with two hosts, and both of them are ChatGPT three <laughs> with text to speech enabled. I love it. I mean, I'm telling you right, right now, you could have a hit. Just make it a 15 minute hit a day. It just auto generates. <laughs> I'll, I'll code it for you. Does that res resonate, Connie, in Paris? Is is ChatGPT basically a mansplainer? I mean, I think that it's just... <laughs> I think that these tools are useful for their very specific use case. It is taking a large amount of information, aggregating it, and spitting that out. I think that in some cases it'll be right, in some cases it'll, it'll be wrong. The fact is it's taking in a large amount of information and what you're getting is it's uh you know version of what it thinks is important and what it thinks is correct so it's never going to reflect the world it's never explaining anything in particular it is just kind of synthesizing it it's, reminds me a lot of I'm, I'm i'm a big redditor that's been my we we're talking about social media lately the social media network i've i guess i've been turning towards more lately as twitter has died is reddit I agree. and they have all these little bots in there where it's like oh we're going to uh, try and uh, take the 
article that was posted and give you the TLDR of you have bought. And most of the time it's wrong. Sometimes it's <laughs> right, though. And I think that's like a little fun experiment is seeing what does the computer think that this actually means. There's the other issue, which is the people who created the original content that these AI are using, right. whether they're artists or writers. Our friend Alex Kantrowitz, who is a regular on the, the show and writes the big technology Substack, uh, said, uh, a writer used AI to plagiarize me, now what? And I was taken in, by the way, by this writer. Maybe you saw it. It's a, uh, a, a Substack called The Rationalist, which looks like it's written by a human. It is not... It plagiarized one of his posts on the creator economy. I saw this post. It was on the front page of Hacker News, a post that said the 1% uh, in, creator, in the creator economy are taking all the money. There's no middle class. It turns out Alex had written this some days before. The Rationalist, he says, is an odd publication. It has no mission. No named authors outside of Petra. It's been live for a week. Yet two days after it went live, it was lifting passages directly from big technology. And he has, you know, the smoking gun for that. The flashy headline, the creator economy, the top 1% and everyone else helped propel his story to the Hacker News front page. It was his story. So this was the first thing that kind of came to my mind when you were asking earlier about what I thought about potentially whether this is going to put journalists out of a job or something is I feel like oftentimes in the news industry we end up having these plagiarism scandals that I mean in some cases obviously it's people taking huge sections of someone else's work but oftentimes it's been like someone lifts a couple sentences or a paragraph and I think if you had publications running unchecked on um AI generated content like this without any editorial oversight, that would happen all the time. This exact example, because aggregating other people's information is going to result in plagiarism. It's kind of like what we're seeing with uh, AI art right now. I was totally fooled by this. I bookmarked the story. I talked about it on some of the shows. Uh, wow. At no point does it say it's AI written. Uh, but it is. But I mean, was it <laughs> lifting it or was it transforming? Yeah. yeah, it starts with a story. As I scroll through my social media feed, I am inundated with the carefully curated lives. It's quite well written, by the way. Uh, it, it's it's a little bit scary. Uh, and if it's a Substack uh, newsletter, it could conceivably make a lot of money. Although some of the commenters did note, this, uh, this sounds like an artificial intelligence. We're getting better, aren't we, at detecting this stuff? Uh, I'm I'm impressed because I didn't detect it, but I think some people are smart enough uh, to, so, to pick it up. So to me, this goes back to even the discussion about social media and what technology has caused in our culture, which is distrust of the, the people and news sources that are out there. And if we could just all take a moment, Hacker News, to vet who they're amplifying and do some due diligence and yeah, check. Yeah. Okay, wait, they don't say that it's an AI, but okay, have a whitelist of sites that you will pull from. And if someone wants to join your whitelist, then have them apply to, to join your whitelist, right? This was an argument that came out years ago with Google News about, oh, you know, we're feeding the disinformation cycle. And I, I wrote a column proposing this. Well, then don't label what you're putting out there as news. Right. Don't put it in the Google News feed. Have a whitelist. And invite people to join, be very clear about what it takes to join that whitelist and be transparent about it so that at least people can trust <laughs> that is not being written by uh, an AI or it's been plagiarized by someone else. Because I think, you know, we all have examples, Paris and I, of our work showing up under someone else's byline very clearly. And what is the recourse? Well, if you work for a media organization, their legal department can send a takedown notice, right? But not everyone can do that. That's a process. It, it could hurt you and your business. And so we all have to get smarter about what we're reading and who we trust and how we consume this stuff. And yeah, that's not something that happens today, but it's something I think that they should be taught in schools, you know, starting from second or third grade or whatever makes sense. I'm not a teacher, but... Um, we need to be more conscious uh, because there is a ripple effect, whether it's plagiarized by an AI or another human being, Alex Kantrowitz was screwed, right? Yeah. By somebody. Yeah. And Absolutely. That, at the end of the day, that's the message is that his work was co-opted. Right. So what is his recourse? And, and he's the victim. So does he have to somehow 
defend himself? Why is he allowed to be victimized? How can we prevent the victimization, if you will? Yeah. I think this is, I mean, we're starting to see, obviously, this question be asked and in some ways answered in the art world, given um, the kind of proliferation of AI tools there. I believe just yesterday there was a class action filed against Stability AI, oh, really? Journey, and DeviantArt for DMCA violations, right of publicity violations, unlawful competition, and, and breach of terms of service by kind of this large group of artists, because obviously the work that is being generated by these companies or uh, makers of AI tools is built off the back of artists who have their work on the internet. It's funny, I would have thought that deviant art was the sewer instead of one of the uh, one of the defendants uh, because most of the stuff on deviant art, at least until recently, was written was done by humans, and I would have thought, oh, those humans were upset about their art being because it's you know that's exactly what stability, stable mm -hmm. diffusion yeah. uh, scrapes and all the other things. But I guess uh, there's so much AI art appearing on deviant art now that uh, they are apparently. <laughs> so I didn't realize this, but apparently deviant art has this uh, product Dream Up. A product ah. that the lawsuit claims unlawfully infringes in the rights of its own art community, I guess by generating AI art. Interesting. So, uh, I mean, this is the this is kind of the other side of this AI stuff is the machine learning comes from publicly available content, whether text or art or, you know, sound. Um, that's how you train these giant models. That's going to be big. So, like, let's That's take GPT future, three. Though. How do you again. get around it? So, the, it has 175 billion possible parameters that it can draw from when yeah. it's when it's generating its content. So, there's I could foresee them making some sort of regulations on what kind of data you can feed to uh, a, a narrow AI. It can't just be here's the internet, take it, because you're going to get so much misinformation. You're going to get so much copyrighted material. You're going to have to start seeing responsible companies saying, we've generated our own data set based on things that we've sampled and we know that it can generate content that is not copyrighted. Um, we don't have that yet, but that's where we're going to be going if these start to catch on. If you actually start to see these being used in a professional environment, that's just going to be part of the legal due diligence. If you don't have a, a uh, parameter set that is free from claim, it's not usable in a commercial setting. Yeah. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.